Welcome to The Sit Down. I am Kevin Mahoney, the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. The Sit Down is our latest addition to our Raging Chicken radio podcast. On The Sit Down, we talk to activists, public intellectuals, investigative journalists, and rabble rousers of all sorts to deepen our discussions and prepare us for the struggles ahead. Raging Chicken Radio is a project of Raging Chicken Press. Check out all our citizen journalism at RagingChickenPress.org. If you are interested in contributing to Raging Chicken Press, or if you have an idea who you'd like to hear on the sit-down, drop us an email at RagingChickenPress at gmail.com, or send us a direct message on Twitter. We're at RC Press on Twitter. And if you like what we're doing here, you know, go over there and click on that support and membership tab and become a member for as little as $5 a month. The only way that we can keep doing what we're doing is through the support of progressives and activists like you. All right. So today on the sit down, we'll be talking with Dr. Amy Lynch Biniak. Amy is a faculty member in the English department at Kutztown University, my colleague, I have to say. Amy, um, Amy is interested in writing pedagogy, literacy studies, and labor studies. Her forthcoming book, Contingency, Exploitation, and Solidarity, Labor and Action in English Composition, is a co-edited anthology with Seth Kahn and Bill Lalliker that explores the ways and means of labor reform on college campuses. She is the chair of the State ABSCUF, that, that's their faculty union, State ABSCUF Adjunct Faculty Committee, and she is currently the editor of Forum, a peer-edited journal from the National Council of Teachers of English. Now, we've got Amy on the program today to uh, talk a little bit about issues of adjunct and contingent labor in higher education and this thing called the Indianapolis Resolution. We'll get into what that means in particular, but the resolution is urges professional organizations in the field of composition and rhetoric, the field that Amy is in, um, to actively cultivate equitable labor conditions in academic departments across the country. So welcome, Amy. How are you doing? I'm great, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so psyched that you're going to join us. Uh, you're join us here on the sit down, and this is uh, kind of an exciting time. We're kind of expanding out what we're doing here and all this. And you know, one of the key issues that's near and dear to my heart, as you know, and we worked together now for God, what, twelve years or something like this. Um, oh, yeah, it's something like that. I think uh, so. You know, and uh, one of the issues near and dear to my heart is kind of is uh, you know labor organizing and higher education, particularly when we're talking about temporary faculty. That's the language that our contract uses. But really, what we're talking about about is adjunct faculty contingent labor and higher ed. So uh, before we get into kind of like the specifics of this Indianapolis resolution and what's going on here, right, give us a little bit of lay of the land of um, what's what's the conditions for adjunct labor um, look like in higher ed today? Well, I think, uh, first of all, what's fortunately getting more press, but it's still unknown by most of the public, is that the growing majority of faculty in higher education are some kind of non-tenure track or contingent faculty. So they're working as really short time labor on shorter contracts. So right away, we find the majority of our professors are in precarious positions. Um, you know, the, the moment you take tenure off the table, that you take a steady job off the table, that all by itself is affecting how effective a professor can be, whether or not he or she will feel comfortable um, exploring their teaching practices in innovative ways as opposed to playing it safe, uh, whether they'll feel comfortable doing research that might be seen as um, out of the box or that challenges the authority. But even uh, beyond that, this, you know, some estimates put it at like 75% of faculty nationwide uh, are in one type or another of these contingent positions. Many of them are being paid um, abysmally, quite frankly. Certainly the conditions are different in each context from school to school, but generally speaking, uh, uh, contingent faculty are paid significantly less than their tenure track and tenured uh, colleagues for doing much of the same work, if not carrying even heavier teaching loads at some times. Um, while the uh, some of our organizations, professional organizations, for example, suggest that a faculty member be paid, I think the number now is $7,350 per course, in some schools that number can go as low as $1,200 per course. So what we're finding is faculty who, in order just to make ends meet, to pay their rent, to buy food, have to work at, at two or three institutions. Um, I just had dinner last night with a young woman who is uh, in an English, in several English departments. She's teaching seven classes across three institutions just to make rent, just to pay her student loans. 
Uh, so that is, is part of the terrain of what they're facing. In addition well, to that, they often don't have benefits, they don't have retirement packages, so it's, it, it's precarious in lots of ways. Well, it's really interesting. You know, here you have these concrete conditions, these material conditions of these uh, uh, contingent faculty members across the country. Um, just as you said, many are just, you know, living hand to mouth, uh, basically trying to pay the rent, trying to pay the bills from week to week, often don't have health insurance. Um, this is kind of something that just flies in the face of the, um, you know, the dominant perception of what a faculty member's life is like, right? So it's it's so it's so kind of disjointed, you know, just kind of on the one hand, you've got, um, you know, legis legislators across the country, like our state in Pennsylvania, certainly this in Pennsylvania, talking about faculty is lazy, that they only work a few hours a week, that they're the most privileged, they don't care about their students and all this. But meanwhile, like, you know, we're talking about, like, it, at the best estimates, we're talking about, you know, 25, maybe 28% of faculty are even tenured or tenured track, right? And then the percentage of those faculty that might qualify as that lazy faculty member is so mm -hmm. minuscule um, that it just flies in the face of the reality. And yet you've got, you know, the bulk of the weight of, of higher education is falling increasingly on the weight um, of those faculty members. And it's especially, um, come, speaking from my position in the English department, it's especially serious in English departments nationwide. We have some of the highest percentages of contingent faculty um, than any compared to other departments across the university. Um, and, and that speaks to you know, even how we treat kind of foundational courses for our students. Um, more often than not, uh, the foundational courses in writing and even in math and history and languages, the things that everybody has to take, are taught by these faculty who are driving around to three universities, uh, who may not have office space, who may not have a parking spot, who may not even have a computer uh, that's provided by the school in order to get their work done, and yet they're teaching uh, these foundational courses. Like you said, this is not what students imagine when they step onto the college campus. It's not what the general public imagines our life to be. You know, there's the stereotype of the elbow patches and the, the, <laughs> the pipe and the, the, the big office with the, the wooden desk and the books. Uh, but for many contingent faculty, uh, the, the cliche, which is true, is that they're actually uh, working out of their cars. You know, it's, it's a far cry from that stereotype of the lazy professor. No, it's incredible. And I remember back, uh, you know, when I was in grad school in uh, kind of the late 90s or so, that um, kind of labor issues were kind of front and center in the field of composition and rhetoric precisely because, I mean, the same issues that you're talking about now. And here we are like almost 40 years later. Um, and and it seems like virtually nothing has changed. If not, they've even gotten worse. And, you know, and it's one thing to study this stuff, right? It's one thing to actually, you know, know that these are issues in the field. And certainly I was aware of those as in part because of all the work in the field as a graduate student. But then I remember when I got my first teaching job, right, was at George Washington University um, as an adjunct, right? Uh, I was getting paid $1,500 a class in Washington, D.C., which is an incredibly expensive place to live. $1,500 a class. I also worked at a bookstore. I worked for a nonprofit organization and I would pick up odd jobs as we went along. And in my office, right? Yeah, we had an office, but it was an office that was probably 10 feet by... 12 feet, maybe 13 feet, right? And there were nine of us that were supposed to share that office, right? So there's no way you're meeting with students in there, right? Um, so it's like the reality of that hit so much. And it's like, you know, what, what, what do we do? So, I mean, I mean, has there been any progress? I mean, how would you characterize like, like the trajectory of what's going on in higher ed over the past like 30, 40 years? You know, I think that the, the progress that has been made is on two fronts. Um, I think on the first front, I can, I, again, speaking for my particular discipline of English, one of the, um, the reasons I think English, and sadly, was on the forefront of, of this growing uh, contingent workforce was because a lot of the work that we did in, in the English department wasn't considered um, really disciplinary. Um, basically, if you can write, you can teach writing. So um, a lot of the, you know, the legions of people teaching writing were, um, it, it was easier to rationalize paying them less and treating them worse <laughs> because eh, they were kind of doing, you know, the broom pushing of the university. You didn't have to be a professional to do that. So in, in the English department, we've made a lot of progress in terms of arguing for um, the teaching of writing and rhetoric as a discipline and being recognized as, as professions. And I think there's been similar 
um, movement made in other departments in terms of earning respect for teaching freshman courses, seeing that as uh, viable and useful work as well. Um, right, but respect respect is quite different than being able to pay your bills, right? Yes, yes. So <laughs> while you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we didn't necessarily have a plethora of journals or conferences, now we do, which is great. The problem is the majority of people who are teaching Comfret can't afford to go to those journals and, and aren't necessarily, or go to those conferences and aren't necessarily supported well enough to write for those journals. So we've gotten, um, you know, professional recognition, but that hasn't come with the kind of material recognition that allows us to do our jobs well. Um, on the other hand, I do think that we've made progress in terms of organizing. Um, sadly, only because the problem has gotten considerably worse. So, you know, in the past couple of years, I've seen articles in the Atlantic and the Washington Post and the New York That's Times right. about adjunct issues, which when I started as an adjunct, you know, 20 years ago, no one knew that word. When I told people I was an adjunct instructor, they had no clue what that meant. Uh, and now that word is getting visibility. So I think we've made progress in terms of bringing that fight to the public and helping them understand what's happening for sure. And there's well, been a lot more organizing as a result. Yeah. And I think that those are great examples. I mean, right now is that, you know, it's almost, you can't go like a week without hearing about a new organizing drive, a new faculty, a uh, new faculty union, whether it's not just adjuncts too as well, because I think increasingly you even see tenure to tenure track faculty feeling that their, their jobs are switching away. But really the, the front lines of this has been adjunct faculty who are organizing unions and are basically saying, you know, forget this. You know, I, I remember back in, you know, in the nineties, the big concern back then was like, well, you know, faculty members, you know, I don't know if we're a union, right? Because, you know, that's the dirty work that the blue collar workers do. And we're better than that. I think a lot of that has been erased by experience to the point where, you know, we have these organizing drives and people are winning and their conditions are getting better. So yeah. we're coming right up to a break. So let me, before, when we come back after the break, one of the things we're going to shift, we're talk a little bit about some of that organizing stuff a little bit later, but I want to get into some of the particulars of this Indianapolis resolution, because this is um, not the kind of stuff that generally makes um, the headlines in the Washington Post, in the Atlantic, in these kind of major publications, right? But it is nonetheless part of the nitty gritty work of organizing, right? The kind of stuff that happens um, inside professional organizations, that happens on college campuses and so on. Um, and this is a really significant one, especially in the field of, of, of composition and rhetoric in the field of writing studies as a whole. Um, so we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about that resolution, some of the background of that, and a little bit about kind of where we go from here. This is Kevin Mahoney. Uh, this is The Sit Down on Raging Chicken Radio. We'll be right back with Amy Lynch Binyak. Welcome back to The Sit Down. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, the Sit Down is a new podcast as part of our project of Raging Chicken Radio. Today, we're sitting down with Amy Lynch Binyak, and we're talking about uh, labor and higher education, adjunct labor, contingency. And specifically, we're going to shift now to a little thing called the Indianapolis Resolution. And one of the reasons I wanted to have Amy on to talk about this is, um, as I was saying before the break, is... Uh, so much of what happens in the day-to-day -day organizing around labor issues um, is not the, the kind of sexy stuff that makes it into kind of national publications and so on. Right? A lot of organizing is local and takes place within specific you know, environments, right? particular rhetorical situations, as we would talk about in our field. But the Indianapolis Resolution just passed. Um, did it pass unanimously, Amy? Were there yeah. a couple people that said no at four C's? At C's, um, well, the resolution itself didn't pass. What they asked us to do was to propose specific statements at the business meeting of C's that they then passed. And that's a, a distinction that the, the conference has asked us to make again and again. So it did, it, the, the core uh, ideas did pass at the uh, conference on college composition and communication. Um, it did. It was not unanimous. In fact, it was a little contentious, but um, the, the, it, there was an overwhelming majority in support, for sure. No, I like that. I'm, I'm, you know, you're insisted on, you keep on making those distinctions. This is the one thing that I find most troubling about working with academics, right, is because um, they want to kind of break this stuff down. I mean, it's not just academics. I mean, but, you know, this is this is our field. This is the kind of stuff where um, 
don't want to confront it right on. So they find these other ways to kind of parse things out or whatever. But that's a, that's another conversation for another day. So if we look at the Indianapolis resolution, kind of what was kind of put forward there initially, I want to read kind of a couple of uh, sentences from the introduction as a way of kind of giving folks that are listening to this a little bit of context. And then maybe then you could kind of fill us in about a little bit about what, what kind of got us to this point, what got you to the point where um, this was kind of on the floor of, you know, the main organization in the field of composition and rhetoric, the Conference on College Composition and Communication, right, their national conference. So here's, here's the Indianapolis resolution as it kind of went forth. So this is from the executive summary. It says, the authors and co-signers of this document wish our professional organizations, institutions, and departments, programs, and composition, rhetoric, writing, and English to work toward reducing the extent to which departments in the field writ large use and exploit contingency to solve problems that are primarily benefit or that primarily benefit the more secure members of those units. We endorse reforms that may better ensure institutional compliance with fair labor practices that incorporate labor study into the graduate pedagogy and professional development and that support research into the impact of labor practices on the teaching and learning of writing. So with that a little, kind of little background, there's your kind of summary of it. What, what, what's kind of, what was the trajectory of this? What got us to this point where we had this resolution? Uh, well, um, you know, honestly, I think where, where this all began, the, the kernel of it um, is actually many years ago in 1987, um, an, another group of activists and scholars and, and teachers uh, at another conference got together to write something called the Wyoming Resolution, on which this is this is absolutely standing on the shoulders of the Wyoming Resolution, um, that called for many of the similar kinds of reforms that, that we do. But what we saw happen was that resolution, which called for the same things you just read, that wanted institutional compliance, a place where mm -hmm. people could bring their grievances and, and you know, make public the abuses they were seeing in institutions and have someone publicly say, yes, what they're doing is wrong. What we saw happen was when it was adopted, um, even unanimously by some of our professional organizations, it was then defanged that anything that would actually hold a university or college accountable was taken out of it. So it became um, more of a, a policy statement saying, yes, be fair, treat people right. And those kinds of statements are useful. And we have many of them. Um, each of our professional organizations has some sort of excellent statement about the fair treatment of contention faculty. But right, but without without the fangs, as you're saying, without the fangs, they could just be, oh, okay, they're kind of feel-good statements to make people feel good about themselves, that they did this yeah. thing, but that they don't have to change anything about what they do. Exactly. I and mean, they can be useful in that, you know, many people in the past 25 years have been able to take those policy statements to WPAs, to their chairs, to their administrators, and say, look, the, these are the kinds of uh, problems that uh, are, are being acknowledged publicly, and these are the recommendations that our professional organizations ha have. And so they've been helping people to make arguments, but only if the administration decides that they care. And very often they don't, right? So they've got limited use. And uh, when a group of us gathered at a workshop at the Four Seas uh, Conference in uh, 2014, we were talking about lab labor organizing and writing programs and writing centers, and we kept coming back to that point that we have support, we know what the problems are, and we were frustrated by the lack of action from our professional organizations. Mm -hmm. That time and time again, their response has been, our position as a professional organization is to offer support or guidance or a place where we can come together and talk about ideas. It's not to sanction. It's not to have fangs, if you will. Uh, so the Indianapolis resolution was kind of our way of working through that and saying, okay, how can we create something that does have the power to publicly uh, bring to light problems at individual institutions? But that's important to you. Absolutely. And I think about, you know, again, uh, you know, the whole claim about as a professional organization where there's there to support and stuff like that, you know, it, it's certain, it's a certain kind of abdication of responsibility, right? Because we have examples of other professional organizations that use teeth, right? Like medical professional organizations, legal professional organizations, you don't follow these things, you're disbarred, right? I mean, you're gone. So there's, yeah. I mean, there are, we have examples where um, there are teeth in other professional organizations. So I mean, it just highlights again, 
choices that people were making about how they understood what the role of this professional organization is. And it seems to me that at least in, in the language where you're talking about the putting the fangs back in here, there's an attempt, you know, here to actually shift, not just, you know, not just make another statement, but actually shift to how we understand what a professional organization can do on these issues. Is that, would that be accurate for you to say? Absolutely. Um, you know, we don't want people to uh, be, you know, forced into changing the constitutions of their organizations, although wouldn't it be great if some of them did? Um, so what we what we did was say, okay, um, you can participate in something even greater, something collaborative. The Indianapolis resolution itself was just a product of an enormous collaboration. The people who contributed to its writing and revision and discussion were many, were legion, and, and ranged from graduate students to tenured professors. Um, and you know, part of that inspired our idea to say, okay, if no, no one organization, the MLA, the, the RSA, the, the Four Cs, wants to take this responsibility, let's have all of these professional organizations, even more than those three, uh, come together and contribute a member to a body that will do these things, that will hear grievances, that will uh, mediate problems. And uh, if those problems can't be mediated, then to make public um, the, the problems in individual institutions. So it, it is kind of a way of, of getting around that old argument of, no, we're hands off, we're just here for support, for sure. Well, it's a, that's a really interesting move too, as well, because then by creating this, by you know, creating this additional body, right? Then they have, I mean, again, not one hundred percent kind of you know objectivity or something, but they have a certain kind of semi autonomy, right, to begin to understand their work as something that's separate from those organizations. So take us to a little bit. So you know, if this goes through, if, if this starts moving in the direction that um, that you all have started, um, what are some of the teeth? Um, behind this resolution? What is the thing that would separate this out or would actually not say separate it out from, but that would add in those things that um, people were frustrated about getting lost or left out from the Wyoming resolution? Okay. Um, we've got, you know, there, there are really three main parts to the resolution. The first is institutional compliance. The second is pedagogy. And the third is research. So um, the kind of actions we're hoping to come out of it is first this creation of a, of a separate body we're not giving it a name, and we haven't in the in the resolution tried to um, dictate rules for what this body would do. What we want is is kind of a congress of, of people from throughout the profession, from different bodies coming together. Um, who uh, the individual uh, faculty members who are experiencing labor problems on their campus could could bring their appeals to this body, um, have their grievances heard. That the uh, this centralized body could then suggest ways of solving the problems, uh, could mediate with the administration, and if not, quite frankly, sanction in some way, what, you know, to publicly say, uh, University X is, you know, in violation of the following best practices. And that speaks to something else that we're, we're already making wonderful progress on, and that is just centralizing what those best practices are uh, I mentioned that many, many of our uh, organ professional organizations have statements in support of faculty, but they're scattered. They're everywhere, on online and offline. Uh, and so one of the things the resolution calls for is some sort of centralized place where all this information can live. And what's, what's wonderful is that um, Susan Doe um, over at the University of Colorado who's already started doing this, um, their, the Colorado State University has started the Center for Academic Study of Labor, mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 not it wasn't made you know uh, with and for the Indianapolis resolution, but it's kind of a nice synergistic moment where they're they're kind of offering a space where we can do that kind of work, so uh, that if you are a tenure track faculty member or you're a contingent faculty member or you're an administrator you don't have to hunt and peck to find out what your rights are or you know what's the recommended class size what's the recommended course load you know it's it's amazing to me um, just how little I knew about what was right and wrong when I began as an adjunct I thought you know my six course load was normal only to find out you know that um, for instance most of our organizations say if you're teaching writing you shouldn't have more than 60 students a semester um, you know, not uh, six classes of 25 or 30 students each. 
uh, in a single semester. So just being able to centralize that information so people know their rights. Because step one, you got to know your rights in order to know that you, there, you have something to grieve. <laughs> no, exactly. And I think this is one of the one of the problems that we face over and over again as academics is because I think most academics, when they're we're doing their training, right, um, we're, you're training in a specific area of study. You're focused on the kind of intellectual work and so on. Um, but there, there's a big gap, right? You're not given that kind of professional background, like as if that is something else that we shouldn't be studying. And that's one of the things that's also, you know, called for in the resolution is kind of, you know, that research and to incorporate this stuff into that professional training. And so, I mean, that alone, because I mean, you know, people, start, people start figuring it out, but they start figuring it out like three, four, five years into it, right? And by then often you could be on a track that is going to kind of lock you into that kind of contingency for a long period of time. Now, personally, one of the things I really like about this resolution, you know, this is kind of, this is the, you know, the effect of, of growing up Catholic, right? You know, the shame factor, right? I mean, I like the shame factor, I got to say, right? So like in here, you know, I mean, you know, you call about it here is kind of a seal of approval that would be used to issue departments and programs that fulfill the current disciplinary standards, then to hear grievances from faculty who believe their departments programs have violated those current standards, establish that process as you were talking about. But I love that idea of a seal. Right, because then you've got the good actors, right, can throw that right up on the department web pages, right, and then once you get to recognize what that is, you can see, say, oh, okay, these people do this, and then you know, I start thinking about it like I want a bad actor seal too, you know, <laughs> like, I want, I want the, I want the, you know, the shame factor there too as well. Now, obviously, no department is going to put that up on their own web page, right, but that's a place where an organization like this, right, or a body like this at least can, um, can make those determinations, and it gives people something to to organize around. Right? Right, that if this faculty, if this particular department is is like you know a notorious violator of labor of, of labor labor rights and the and horrible conditions of adjuncts, well then we could put pressure on it using this language as a way of moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and you talked about not not knowing, uh, and how we don't make this part of our education. It was really important to many of us uh, who drafted the document that we talk about graduate education. Uh, and that labor conditions be part of it, not just because, we, yes, we want students to understand what they're getting themselves into and what the, the system is like, because there is that persistent myth that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but even because it affects the teaching itself. You know, as graduate students, we become enamored of this ideal teaching uh, environment. We, we, we dream of all the critical pedagogies that we're going to enact in our classrooms, uh, how we're going to meet one-on-one -on -one with each of our students every other week, and so on and so forth. We're going to write tomes in response to each of their drafts. Uh, and then when you get out into the actual job market, into the real world, and you are uh, you know, employed as an adjunct, and even as a tenure track faculty member, you realize, oh, I can't do any of that. My labor conditions don't allow me to. And I think it's important to train students not just for some ideal classroom, but also for the classroom they're more likely to be sitting in front of. No, I think that's a great point. You know, it reminds me is one of the one of my pet projects that I've been, I you know, so like one of my dream little side projects along the way is to begin to um, um, accumulate clips, movie clips that represent faculty lives, right? Um, by pictures of their offices, by pictures of their teaching conditions, and those kind of stuff, and to run that counter to kind of what what's actually out there. But we're coming up to another break here. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about, OK, so we've got this resolution, right? Then what does this mean actually kind of to moving forward for kind of like a tool for fighting, a tool for struggle, right? And why, you know, is this actually valuable, right? Is this whole idea valuable? I'm going to argue that it is, and I'm going to tell you a little bit why. Um, but then I want to ask Amy a little bit about, you know, OK, so now let's put, put ourselves, you know, this is a national organization. This is this resolution. OK, so now you got people who go back to their campuses. They're on the ground here. Um, and what's this mean for kind of where we kind of move forward? And I'll ask her to talk a little bit about that. All right. So we'll be right back. This is The Sit Down, the Raging Chicken Radio. I'm Kevin Mahoney, uh, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We will be right back after this. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's The Sit Down. I am Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. I'm sitting here with Amy Lynch-Binyak, uh, and she's talking to us about 
adjunct labor and higher education contingency and what we can do about it. So right before the break, we're talking about the Indianapolis resolution. We're talking about the this resolution as being a way for professional organizations to put some pressure upon departments um, to actually comply with equitable labor conditions and ways that this can actually aid faculty members who are interested in organizing around these issues um, to help organize and to put pressure back on those um, departments through their organization efforts. So, you know, as I was, we were talking about this, I started thinking a little bit about the uh, the the Democratic primary right now. I know that's a huge jump there, but here let me. And I'm thinking about the debates that are going back and forth between um, uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders in particular, and um, whether or not, particular coming out from the Sanders people, but whether it's worthwhile to try to change the Democratic Party. And I came across this article that was uh, written by Seth Kahn, who's also, you know, you work very closely with Seth in terms of drafting the resolution and working with with other people. I and mean, Seth has been, you know, a, a friend of both of ours for quite some time, one of my kind of strongest comrades out there. Um, and he was making a case, this kind of appeared in an article from the uh, Majority Rule, the official blog of the New Faculty Majority, and a thing called The Case for Working in a among disciplinary organizations. And I just want to read this bit because I think it helps frame a little bit about why we would choose to do something like this. And he's, he's responding to the question about whether it's worth doing this. And he says, quote, I firmly believe that our professional organizations can be powerful forces for normalizing the discourses of labor equity. The policies we put in place may have no legal force. The resources we can offer probably won't overwhelm the resources of neoliberal hegemony but healthier organizational discourses keep us from sounding like the troublemakers and instead makes people who don't speak those discourses sound as inhumane as they are. And I couldn't help but think about the discourse in the presidential campaign. And here's the connection with the Bernie Sanders campaign. It's like to think that, I mean, in my lifetime, you know, we, we grew up like Cold War babies and all this other kinds of stuff, right? To think that you'd have a presidential camp, um, candidate who was uh, like a, a contender for the nomination to be openly talking about being a socialist was unthinkable right yeah. the fact that that you know he talked about socialism we talk about taxing the rich making wall street pay like economic inequality i mean these are the kinds of things where that i think seth is kind of making reference to is that by normalizing that discourse right you know people who are doing that organizing aren't sounding like oh you're the one who are trying to destroy the world but you're the ones who are actually, you know, behind what is good and what is right. And it's those people, the administrators, the management, this whole kind of neoliberal approach to higher education, that is the problem. So, you know, in that spirit, I was thinking about, you know, um, pushing from within these organizations and then actually trying to kind of move that ball forward. When we start taking a resolution like this and then kind of going back to our campuses and so on and thinking about, um, how this might aid in people that are actually doing the organizing, whether it's, you know, at Kutztown University's campus or kind of any campus across the country. I mean, how might you see those connections? What might somebody do with this? That's a really good question. And I, I think it works on a lot of different levels. Um, and that's important because everybody has different comfort levels when it comes to activism as well. You know, I've, I've spoken to some non-tenure track faculty, for instance, who are rightfully very wary of, of being in the spotlight, and I respect that. Um, I've always been one to yell at the top of my lungs, but that doesn't mean I think everybody should. So there's, I think there's lots of ways to enact this. And, you know, for instance, a very, very simple one uh, goes back to, you know, how we talk to our students uh, about labor issues, whether they be undergraduates or graduate students, as we mentioned before, that if we make the connections between labor conditions and uh, learning conditions, uh, part of our everyday conversation about their education, right? I think that goes a long way to normalizing, as you were saying, uh, this discourse that, that we aren't crazy, <laughs> uh, that uh, they're not going to just see that conversation as something external to their lived experience, but it's something there all the time. And that's something that, that all of us can do to one degree or another. Um, but, you know, the, the other, I think that the resolution gives us a tool to speak to administrators very powerfully. Uh, we live in an age where universities are becoming so corporatized that they are very concerned with image, right? They're very concerned with PR. Uh, and whether it's the seal of approval 
and saying, mm -hmm. going to your administrator and say, hey, I'd like to work on getting this seal of approval from this body. Uh, or going to your administrator and saying, you know, we're in violation of these principles and we are ripe to have someone bring a grievance to this body. <laughs> That can be a powerful uh, motivator towards action on the ground, you know, to have that conversation, uh, whether it be with your chair, or your dean, or your provost. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think about it like this, too, as well. I mean, I'm an unapologetic kind of um, kind of union guy who believes that, you know, that unions really that kind of organization could be one of the greatest tools in this in this fight. Right. And I think that, you know, the idea, you know, I think about on the one hand, we've got this this discourse, we've got this um, we've got this uh, this resolution. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that and you're a far more diplomatic person than I am. And, you know, this, <laughs> um, but um, that, you know, those kind of conversations become um, important. It's that kind of like, say, diplomatic move, say, look, this is kind of important. This is something that um, that could actually benefit us if we have this seal. Uh, but other, but at the, on the other end of it, too, as well, it can be the tool where, you know, to organize around, like, these are the conditions. This is why we are organizing a union. This is why we are organizing um, to fight back for our rights. This is why we believe that this university is in violation of some basic um, kind of labor conditions. So I think about that as, you know, I, I already have these images in my mind. If you have to wait to see what the seal looks like so you can put on a picket sign and then cross it out as you're picketing outside in front of your uh, <laughs> in front of your university yeah you know and even we talk about organizing and it, i'm reminded again and again how many of us uh, across the university often still feel isolated and feel they're not necessarily sure if what's happening in their program or their department or their campus is normal or not. There's a great uh, article coming out, if, if you don't mind me plugging this, in, in forum issues about part-time and contingent faculty uh, in the fall, uh, where a, a group of faculty are doing a study of writing center uh, uh, directors and staff, most of whom today are contingent as well. Uh, and one of the things they found in interviewing hundreds of uh, writing center staff members that most of them had no clue if the conditions on their campus were normal, you know? And, and so the resolution and the, the bodies it's proposing uh, allows people to feel connected, allows people to feel uh, a sense of where they stand in relation to the field writ large, you know, locally and nationally. Uh, I think that the new faculty majority does a great job of this as well. And if any of your, your listeners or viewers are interested in learning more about these issues, that's a great place to start is the new faculty majority. But it, I think that we can do some basic organizing work here and just letting people know uh, what, how their conditions measure up to conditions across the country. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I'm reminded of, you know, one of the first interviews I ever did for Raging Chicken Press was with Noam Chomsky. And one of the things that Noam Chomsky talked about was how that, you know, some of the biggest social movements um, start with something as simple as um, getting a stoplight at an intersection that's dangerous, right? The idea of building that, um, that notion that you can win, right? If you organize, you can win. And I see this kind of a step kind of in that direction. So Amy, if, if there's people that are interested in this resolution and they're interested in kind of showing their support, is there a place that they can go to kind of either sign on to this or kind of support? Um... Absolutely. The easiest place to learn more about and even sign the Indianapolis resolution, if you'd like, is to go to compositionist.net. That's composition with an I-S-T on the end, .net. And you'll find a button there that uh, says Indianapolis resolution. There is uh, some background information there that discusses uh, the, the day we all came together to first start drafting this. Uh, you can read the resolution in full. And you can actually uh, digitally sign if you like, which we very much appreciate. Uh, you can also feel free to contact me if you're interested in taking this resolution to your professional organization uh, or, to, or you know, even to your campuses and talking about it more. And I'd be, be glad to, uh, to, to talk more about it to anyone. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we get links um, both to, uh, to Amy's email and to the Indianapolis resolution that'll go in the show notes down here to make sure that people got it. And uh, and I just want to remind everybody that so we were fortunate enough to be joined today by Dr. Amy lynch Beniak, um, who's a faculty member of the English Department at Kutztown University. I want to plug again. Amy, do we have a uh, publication date yet for that book? 
Uh, I believe it's going to come out in January of 2000. Around January. Well, look for it. She is the uh, she is her forthcoming book is called Contingency, Exploitation, and Solidarity: Labor and Action in English Composition, and it's co-edited with Seth Kahn and Bill Lalaker. Please check it out. I know Amy's work well, and uh, I mean seriously, um, is one of the strongest voices uh, in support of equitable labor relations and higher education right now. So uh, yeah, so uh, you can let your head swell on that for a little bit. I'll but it's absolutely true. Uh, don't take thank my word you. for it. Just go read her stuff. All right. So thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. This is Raging Chicken Radio's The Sit Down. And this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We'll be back. And don't forget, on next Tuesday, uh, we'll have our regular scheduled podcast um, that Out the Coop, where we'll be sitting down with Sean Kitchen. Um, and you can look for continuous interviews coming up as part of The Sit Down at Raging Chicken Radio. You can check us out on the Podbean. That's the best place to go. Get the Podbean app or check us out online looking for Raging Chicken Radio. But we are also on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google play music we're all over the place so if you're looking for us just put raging chicken radio in there and you're sure gonna find us and don't forget to uh like us to you know to subscribe to us and to leave us a comment let us know that you're checking us out this is kevin mahoney signing off until next time everybody see ya